Good morning. Great to see everybody talking together and catching up. Hope everyone had a great week last week. And hope you have a good week in the, in the coming week. Wonderful. So if you take uh, your bulletins and turn to the announcements. We've got two things listed on the announcements. We've got our summer Wednesdays and our tithing. Uh, just real quick on the tithing, again, uh, dropping things in the back. Actually, I guess our box is gone because we're going to start getting back to, uh, to passing the, the plate again like we did last Sunday. So I guess that's a reminder for me that we have to stand up and do that again. So I'm trying to get, <laughs> trying to get my mind back going again. Um, but if you want to send your checks, so if you still want to continue to do that, that's fine. Uh, we just ask that you'd send it to the address listed in here. It's the Fisher's house. That way I can make it there rather than just sitting in the mailbox out here. Cool. All right. And then the other thing, so with the Wednesdays, summer Wednesdays, still meeting every Wednesday, enjoying the time together of, of fellowship and of studying the word. This coming Sunday, or Sunday, this coming Wednesday, sorry, we are going to just kind of have a time of fellowship. So we're still getting together again. Um, we're not really going to spend the time in the word like we had been before. Just fellowship. If you want to bring something to share, that would be great as well. And um, that part of the reason for that is the fact that the Marusics are getting a chance to go on vacation, which is awesome. Good to see you, Jackson. Glad that you're here. We get to hang out as a full family. That's cool. Get to have a good time out on the houseboat, right? Good luck with that. I know. <laughs> Kelly's so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now you get a little nervous about it. Primitive facilities a bit, but you know it's that's fine. It'll be good. It'll be a good time together as family. So we're glad you guys get to head off. You're heading off today after uh, after service. Have a great time uh, on vacation. Uh, but because of that, since Steve had been leading the the time together in the Word, uh, we're just going to go ahead and enjoy having time together. So please come out to the Fishers. We'll have a good time together. Cool. All right. So I think that's. The announcements, the only thing we have to update. Good, all right. So with that, then, if you would please turn to the call to worship, and if you'd rise. Call to worship this morning is based on Psalm 50. I'll read the unbolded part if you'd repeat back in the bold. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. God calls and we respond to his love. The heavens declare God's righteousness. We tell out God's glories. Offer up to God your thanksgiving and our God will hear us, save us and stay with us forever. Amen, let's pray. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for your deep, deep and sustaining love for your people. Thank you, Lord, that you call us together. You call us to come and worship you. You call us to fellowship with one another and to lift each other up. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us today as we come and we open your word. We pray, Lord, that you'd give us ears to hear, that you would change our hearts and conform us to Christ. We pray, Lord, as we sing praises to you, that you would be pleased and that they would be changing to us as well. Again, conform us to Christ. Make us to be the people that you call us to be. Let us walk in your way, walk in your light. We give you thanks, Lord, for your blessing and your love. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Getting so into that, I forgot I had to come back up here. All right, our New Testament reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by the saying and, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child, will be born, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The angel, de the angel departed from her. Amen. Now we have the opportunity to come and confess our sins uh, before the Lord. And again, I'll read the, uh, the confession with you and we'll repeat in bold, the bold piece. We'll have a silent time where we can pray and confess our individual sins to the Lord, and then we'll hear an assurance of pardon. So if you would, please read aloud with me. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sins, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love, have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. you've placed your faith in Christ and you have assurance of pardon. We hear this from Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, I'm glad you're here. Our confession of faith is actually, I really did say something like this, this is my favorite portion of all of our constitution. So in our, in our church, we have a constitution, our denomination, we have a constitution. It's made up of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger catechism, the shorter catechism, and this is my absolute favorite portion of the entire thing. Uh, not, it doesn't make it more special because it is, but it's just more special to me. Uh, but it gets at a key thing that we all need to understand. So it's question 21 from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I'll read the question. Would you read the answer aloud with me? Who is the only redeemer of God's elect? The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Now, just a quick truth that flows out of this, every one of us should know. I hope you know, and if you don't, let me tell you. We can't save ourselves. We cannot uh, achieve salvation for ourselves. We're never going to be good enough in our own works to stand before God. But God in his grace and mercy has provided a redeemer. He's provided a capital R redeemer. Every week when we're talking about the judges, I often say a, a, a lowercase s savior or a lowercase or a lowercase r redeemer. But Jesus is the capital R redeemer. He is the one true redeemer of God's people. He died so that we could be set free from the penalty of death, from the wrath of God and from our sin. And so because of that, we can come to God with real confidence that he hears our prayers. Also, I just want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room, all those fathers watching on video as well, but we come to God who is our Father, who loves us infinitely more than we could ever love our own children. Think about that, moms and dads. Uh, and even if you're not a mom and dad, you can probably imagine this. There's a point in which Jesus is teaching and he says, look, fathers, you know how to give good gifts to your children. You know that if they ask for an egg, you don't give them a snake. If they say, can I have some bread, you don't give them a stone. And he says, how much more your father in heaven? You're sinful and you know how to give them a good gift. How much more your father in heaven? That's how much we love. Just finally, um, there's a portion of Jesus' final prayers to God the Father uh, that we have recorded in John 17, where he actually says, Father, love them, meaning his people. Love them with the same love with which you have loved me. And that is just amazing. So even as we think of Father's Day and as we go to the Lord in prayer, let's remember that he is our ultimate father, and um, he hears our prayers as we are his sons and daughters that he loves with an infinite love. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do come to you in that, in that love that you have for us, Lord. We come to you in the name of Christ, and we come to you even clothed in his righteousness, Lord. He is our Redeemer, and we thank you and praise you for that. The greatest gift we will ever receive, Lord, is that you sent your Son to die on the cross for us. You have given us his righteousness, Lord. We thank you and praise you for that, Lord. Oh, Lord to be your sons, to be your daughters, and to know that you will eternally love us, Lord. Thank you for that. Heavenly Father, we do rejoice in fatherhood. And I'll pray for all the fathers in this room or represented in this room or watching on video, Lord. And we want to thank you for them. We want to ask you to bless them. 
We want to ask you to give them wisdom, Lord. Lord, help us as fathers to be good models to our children of your love, of your grace and mercy, of your patience. And Lord, help us also to do something you've never had to do, which is ask for forgiveness, Lord. Help us when we fail our children, when we err, to to just admit it, because we know we're saved by Christ. We're saved by his grace and mercy. Lord, so I pray that we'd be able to ask our children for forgiveness, Lord, but may we be good fathers. And we also lift up the mothers today, Lord, and ask you to bless them and love them. And Lord, we lift up every person in this room, because we're all children. We all have fathers, earthly fathers, Lord. And honestly, some of us had great fathers, Lord, and we rejoice in that. Some of us did not, Lord. And I pray that for those of us who feel that we did not have a great father here on earth, that we would look to you, the one who loves us perfectly, that always gives good gifts, the one who has provided for us salvation, Lord. Father, we continue to ask you to be at work in each one of us. Lord, even as we sung this wonderful song about the Holy Spirit, the living breath of God, be at work in us, Lord. Would you do that, Lord? Work in us to remind us of your love. Work in us, Holy Spirit, that we would walk in the ways of God, that we would honor you in everything we do. Lord, your word says, whether we eat or drink or do any such thing, that we should seek to honor and glorify you. So we pray that you would enable us, Holy Spirit. Spirit, be at work in us, Lord, that we might be sharing your love with the world by word and deed. Lord, that we might share it with our families, that we might share it with our neighbors, our co-workers, our fellow students. Lord, that we might share it with strangers. Lord, I pray even that we would share it with those who we might consider enemies or those who might consider us their enemies, Lord. I pray that you would fill us, Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would be united, even as we've sung, Lord, may we be united in Christ, Lord, knowing that We have all kinds of differences, differences in upbringing, differences in maybe race, even nationality, even in this small crowd, we have that, Lord. Lord, we have differences in political thought or thoughts about many other things, Lord, but may we be united in the fact that we are your children, Father, that we are redeemed by you, Lord Jesus Christ, and Spirit, that you indwell each one of us who is in Christ, Lord. May that give us a great uh, basis for unity, for love for one another. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to, to blow away this pandemic, Lord. We bless those who are doctors and nurses. We're treating those who have still contracted it, Lord. But we pray, Lord, that even as represented by the fact that so many of us are here today, that you will continue to remove all traces of the pandemic, not just here, Lord, but around the world. We pray that um, you would bless us, bless the world that you have created. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be at work in this world, that you would be at work from here to every point on the globe, every point in which there is a person made in your image, Lord, would you be at work? Would you call people to know you and love you? Would you be at work through your church and even beyond your church, Lord, to call people into your kingdom? Lord, would sinners just like us be saved from their sins because they are hearing the words of life that Christ alone is the only redeemer for anyone, Lord. I pray that you would make us diligent and bold enough and loving enough to share it with those we know. Heavenly Father, for your good gifts, we thank you. Heavenly Father, for your love, we thank you. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to be at work in this church and through this church. We pray that you will bless each person here, and again, every person who's a part of our church, whether they're here, watching on video, or whatever, Lord. Now, Father, for the gifts we are about to receive, we pray that you will use them, be glorified by them, and Lord, would you grow your kingdom through them. Lord, we commit them to you, and we pray in the name of your true Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
stand as we sing glory to the Father. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Um, well, this week we are starting to look at Samson, who's the last judge appointed by God. And honestly, probably everybody, whether you grew up in the church or not, has heard this story. Uh, it's an extraordinarily popular story. It's been made into movies. It's been made into miniseries. Uh, but interestingly enough, The part we're going to look at is probably the least known part, but in some ways, it's, I don't want to say it's the most important part, but it definitely sets the stage for who Samson really is. Um, And we can learn so much, and we're going to take three Sundays to look at the life of Samson, because we can learn so much about who God is, who we are, and how God works in us, and more importantly, even on on our behalf. So anyway, I'm just really excited to um, start this portion of the book of Judges. But also, let's be honest, if you're like me, like when you were a kid, this was like one of your favorite stories, because I mean, it's like an action movie. It's almost like a comic book or something. So so even as we enjoy the story, uh, let's pray that the Lord will enable us to learn and be changed by it. But let me read to you Judges chapter 13. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink. Eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, so then drink no wine or strong drink. And eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. The angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. 
for Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that when, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it, offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders, and Manoah and his wife were watching. When the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and, his, and to his wife, and Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering in our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanana Don, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, would your spirit stir in each one of us? Would you teach us from your word? Lord, help us to see your hand at work. Lord, we pray in the name of your Son. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Well, shocker of shockers, it starts, Judges 13, by saying, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That is basically a, almost a theme verse. We keep coming to it. Again, we're spiraling down. We're spiraling down. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So just really quickly, I want us to think about that. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. One of the most famous verses from the whole book of Judges says this, and we're, we're coming to it in a few weeks. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, for the land had no king. See, it's, it's not that the people were thinking, well, the last judge died. You know what? Let's go and do something evil. Because that's not really how people work. I, I don't think I've ever met someone who said, you know what? I want to go out and do some evil. You know, let's go out and do something wicked today. It's not how we work. When we do something that's sin, what happens is we're thinking this is okay. Or maybe even on some level, we know it's wrong, but we justify it in some way. We say, well, I have to do this. I have to break God's commands because I have a very good reason. I have a, have a good reason for stealing from work. I have a good reason for lying to my wife. I have a good reason for doing this evil thing. Maybe we don't even allow ourselves to call it evil. We say, well, it's just a little white lie. Or, you know, it's just a necessity, it's a necessary evil, if we even say that word out loud, or even allow ourselves to think it. But no one thinks actively, they never say to themselves, I'm going out to do evil. But the thing is, the people of God here in Israel are living in defiance and contradiction to God's law. And really... For all of us, we have to determine, am I going to live in accordance with God's law or I'm going to live in accordance with the law of something else or someone else? Now, we may say to ourselves, well, you know, only I can determine what's right for me. That's really been kind of a popular idea, even being taught at the university level, at least since I was in uh, college way back in the early 90s. You know, only you can decide what's wrong for you. Uh, or maybe we think, well, everyone knows this is wrong. Kind of the group knows. That group might be our group of friends, might be people in our district, you know. I grew up in the South, and the South definitely, I grew up with a certain set of values being a Southerner. And then I've lived 
in Missouri and here in the Midwest, and I can tell you there are Midwestern values. That's even a phrase, mid, mid, Midwestern values. Lived in New England on the East Coast, and there were certain sets of values. And certainly if we grew up in another nation, they, it has its own set of values. It, does the group determine? And now we have a powerful thing called social media. And lots of people look to social media, what they're reading on social media, or they're hearing in a podcast or something like that to determine what's right or wrong. Could be just general society. Maybe it's a powerful leader. Maybe it's a political leader. Maybe it's just someone who's a celebrity. You know, lots of people take their cues on what's right and wrong from a celebrity. How do we determine what's right and wrong? The Bible lays before us that God, who is eternal, who created all things, this is what he says is right. In fact, the Bible tells us that his law is a reflection of his very character. His law, which ultimately can be summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, is an outflow of his character, that he is eternal, that he created us so he knows how we work best. He's outside of time. He's not affected by the whims of society. The problem with following the group or society is those things change. The Just to use a very prevalent, right in front of our face example is the way we think about sex and sexuality has changed radically. I just turned 50. I can tell you, when I was 20, it was very very different. How we think about sex and sexuality and things like gender have changed. And bluntly, they're going to change again. 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, they'll change. How we think about lots of things change, right? Will we allow the word of God, which transcends society, transcends time, and is, was given to us by our creator, Will it be our God, or will we ultimately say, well, I'm going to allow myself to figure it out. I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. But God is gracious. Note that it says, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines. He disciplines them for 40 years. But then... The rest of this story is the story of God once again coming in to redeem his people. But notice we're missing something that we've had in almost every story. In almost every story, we've had the, some line that basically says, and the people cried out to God. Remember last week we looked at the fact that they cried out and God said, yeah, I'm tired of this cycle, this wash, rinse, repeat thing we're doing here. Um, you keep crying out, saying, oh, God, we're sorry. Please come save us. And then you go back and worship false idols, and you do evil and wicked things. And they come and they say, we're putting away our gods, and they truly repent. They don't even do any of that, or we don't at least have it recorded. But God is a God of grace. Just really quickly, God means unearned favor. In fact, it even means that we deserve God's wrath, and what we get instead is blessing and love. People of Israel, in this story, they deserve God's unending wrath. And yet, what he's going to give them is great grace. The second point here is that God is at work. God is at work, and he is with his people. And that's something we need to really kind of store away as like the basic code of our lives. If you are in Christ, know that God is at work in your life. And he is at work for your good. That he loves you, cares about you, wants to bless you, is working in this world for your ultimate good. That's what the word of God says. Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good for his people. Okay, God is at work. He is with his people. Well, think about this now. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. 
for whatever reason, we don't know his wife's, wife's name. And his wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord comes and says, Behold, you are barren, with not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now we're going to skip ahead. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So what's my point here? Think about this. How many people know that God's doing something miraculous and special at this point? One, Mrs. Manoa. Everyone else knows that they are oppressed by the Philistines. Everyone else knows that they are under God's discipline. Everyone else knows that life is being made to be horrible because a foreign, godless power, a wicked nation, has power over them. Except God knows what he's doing, and Mrs. Manoa knows what he's doing now. And no one will begin to see the fruit of this plan for probably minimum 18 years. It doesn't give an exact date of when Samson begins to do the things he does to defeat the Philistines. But we know he was grown. He was old enough. We'll, we'll see next, next time that we look at Samson. We know that he's old enough to take a wife. So there are years in which God's plan is developing, and people were probably saying things like, Where's God? Where's Yahweh? Is he going to save us again? Will he intervene on our behalf? Will he redeem us? Will he come and save us from the Philistines? There's always a faithful remnant. So even though the word tells us that people were living in sin, there, was, there would have been a faithful remnant, people praying to the Lord, asking for redemption, asking for relief. And God was at work. So it's interesting that we don't get anything from Samson's birth until his adulthood, very similar to the narrative of Jesus, by the way. But God was at work. It took 18 years. Maybe it took 25 years. We don't, we're not 100% sure. But God was at work in the world. And this is super important for us to grasp because right now you might be going through something where you're thinking, it just feels like God's abandoned me. It feels like God doesn't see. It feels like God doesn't see, he doesn't know, or he doesn't care. And we have to see life a little broader than that. We have to realize that God is always at work even if we don't see. It's not... God is our God, right? He's, he's not our idol. We don't do things that control him. We don't, he's not a magic spell that we pray and then it automatically happens the way we want it. What the word tells us is God is always at work on behalf of his people to accomplish good for his people, to bless his people. But it doesn't say and therefore, anytime you pray, immediately you're going to see the answer. It doesn't say, and therefore, when you want God to work, he's going to work immediately at that moment the way you want him to work. But God is at work, and we just often don't know it or see it. I'll give you a quick illustration of how, I mean, kind of two quick illustrations that are basically the same thing. We often have things happening in our lives, and we miss that God's beginning to do a blessing. Let me give you one. Uh, Keith knows one of my absolute best friends. He's a guy named Eric. Eric is another PCA pastor, our denomination. I met Eric because I knew a guy named Kirk, and Kirk knew a guy named Bob, and Bob knew Eric. Kirk and Bob decided to live together in this old rundown house in Auburn, Alabama. And they needed two other roommates. So Kirk went and got me. Bob went and got Eric. 
And when I met Eric, I immediately thought, what a jerk. And then we started living together, and the whole probably first two months of living together, we were secretly both thinking, man, that's actually such a jerk. It was just a weird situation. We really did not like each other. We just kind of, we, we were polite to each other, but it was good. We, we had rooms on the opposite end of this old house, and we would be polite and everything. We were both believers. But then winter came, and the way our schedules worked out, we just were home together in the house between classes every single day. And this is probably the weirdest thing in the world. Every day, we started watching Little House on the Prairie together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in fact, it's still known in my house as El Hop, because Eric called it El Hop. And we just started laughing about how, how many of the plots revolved around Charles Ingalls beating somebody up on behalf of his wife. In fact, it kind of came to this joke. And somewhere in the middle of watching El Hop together with Eric Zellner, we became like great friends. And we started laughing together. And now he is absolutely one of my best friends in the entire world. Talk to him every two weeks at a minimum. I didn't see it coming. I have been blessed so much by that relationship. I've been blessed in ways I'll probably never in this life be able to fully express or even know. And the first thought I had was, oh my goodness, i got to live for a year with this jerk. I can't believe it. Well, we don't often see the blessings God is bringing into our life. Things are happening now in your life and in the world and God's at work. And maybe it's going to be a year before you see it. Maybe it's going to be five years. And maybe it's going to be 18 years. And maybe you won't even fully see it. In fact, I know we won't fully see it until we're on the other side. And we're either in heaven or in the new heavens and the new earth. And then we'll say, oh, wow, God, I didn't see what you were doing there. And I know I'm belaboring this point, but we got to get that. Because we can't allow what we think about God to be determined by this circumstance today. If you're sick today, you could go, well, God must have abandoned you. Well, no, it just means you're sick today. But God is constantly working his plan of redemption. So here he is. People of God are being oppressed by the Philistines, and God does something miraculous. Notice what it says about Mrs. Manoah. She was barren and had no children. In that day and age, that was kind of seen as the ultimate curse for a woman. So much of a woman's identity was growing up and reaching the right age and getting a husband and then bearing children. A woman was seen as most blessed if she had lots and lots of children. And here's this woman, and she has no children whatsoever. People would have gossiped about her. People would have wondered if God's hand was specifically against her. And yet, God's going to do something miraculous. The angel of the Lord, who as we've been saying all along, we believe is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God, comes to her and says, Behold, you are barren and have not born children but you shall conceive and bear a son. I mean, it's a miracle. And God seems to like this kind of miracle because he repeats it over and over and over again. Rebecca was barren and could not have children. Rachel was barren and could not have children. After this story, there's a woman named Hannah, who some of you may know the story, and she was barren and could not have children. And then there was a woman named Elizabeth, who was barren and could not have children. She gave birth to John the Baptist. 
Anna gave birth to Eli. Secondly, we note that this child is not just to be any child. He is going to save the people of Israel. He shall, he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So this child has a mission in life, a specific mission in life, to be God's redeemer. There's a purpose on his whole life. In fact, the purpose is so special that the angel of the Lord says, no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite from the womb. Now, what does that mean? There was a special category in God's law that if someone wanted to take a Nazarite vow, which was a temporary thing, what they would do is they would cease to drink wine or eat grapes or anything of the fruit of the vine. They would not cut their hair for the entire length of the vow, and they would be dedicated to the Lord in a special way. It was a way for them to outwardly say, yes, we, all the people of Israel, are set apart to God, but right now I have made a special vow to the Lord, and I am honoring him in a special way with my lifestyle. So they wouldn't cut their hair, they wouldn't drink wine, they wouldn't eat grapes, and certainly they would never eat anything unclean. Their life was temporarily set apart in a special way to God. But this child, this son is going to be so special that it's like, hey, it starts right now. Before you even can see, stop drinking wine. Stop eating anything of the fruit of the vine. Certainly don't eat anything unclean. Because even from the womb, this child is going to be set apart to God. This child is going to be a savior. Well, what does it make us think of? I hope. There's a reason I had one of the Christmas narratives, one of the Advent narratives read there. Because this, we should, as New Testament Christians, we should be thinking about Jesus. I mean, Samson was announced by an angel. He was set apart, not for a temporary time, his whole life. He was to be a Nazarite, to never cut his hair. He was to never drink wine. He was never to eat of the fruit of the vine. He was never to have anything unclean. His whole life was meant to be set apart to God in a special way. And it says he was to be the redeemer of God's people. He was to be the savior who would save them from the Philistines. We'll come back to that idea. Really, I want to look at the next thing as a, a side note, but I think it's an important side note. This is for men especially. Men, listen to your wives. There has grown up in the last few years something within Christianity and especially seems to infect Reformed circles. Listen, the Bible does teach the husband is the head of the wife. The Bible does teach the husband, the father is the head of the household. I affirm that. What it does not teach is you are some sort of unrivaled master that doesn't have to ever listen to his wife, confer with his wife, or that your wife is some sort of servant that just constantly waits on you to impart all truth and leadership to her. Okay? I, I, a couple of ways I've seen it. Uh, I don't think this exists in our in our church, but I've seen it, and I want to warn against it. You know, I, I know women who've told me, like, well, I don't have my own social media account. And this isn't plugging for social media, because it can be terrible and gross. But I don't have my own Facebook account, because, you know, I want to be, you know, my husband feels like I need to be submissive to him, so I don't even have my own social media account. Even worse, I've seen it things like, this, sadly, this article kind of got popular for a while. People teaching things like, you know, if your wife's not washing the dishes when you tell her to, your wife's not the weight you want her to be. This was all in a very popular article. If your wife's not treating you in the bedroom the way you want to, you know, talk to her a couple of times and then bring in the elders to discipline. That's taking biblical truths and twisting them to be something awful and wicked. Why do I bring this up in the story? Medoah 
does not do a good job of listening to his wife. She comes and brings the word of God to him. She says, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. Note later, they never get his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, so then drink no wine or strong drink, eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with this. Manoah prays to the Lord and says, Please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. Note when the angel of the Lord returns, he doesn't change the instructions. He doesn't say anything new. I just want to note that his reaction is to say, we've seen the face of God, we shall surely die. And she has to say to him what maybe would have just been common sense here. Well, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. I mean, listen, I want, to be, I want to be careful. Manoah has just seen a miracle. He's just seen the angel of the Lord rise up and ascend into heaven, and I'm sure it was awesome. But he puts it together like, we're about to be struck dead. Well, you can't conceive and give birth to a son if God strikes you dead. And his wife was smart enough to know that. So praise the Lord for Mrs. Manoah just to say, oh, well, you know. So I'm kind of being funny a little bit, but, but, but seriously. Because it seems to be this growing thing in, in Reformed circles, and it's not outrageously growing, but yes, husbands are the head of their wife. Fathers are the head of the household. But that comes with a lot of caveats directed by the word of God and certainly men be a gracious leader in your household be a listening leader in your household and definitely listen and weigh the wisdom of the wife the Lord has given you listen to her love her and treat her well Finally, though, what do we get from this story? I mean, it's amazing. They do come out and they say, hey, teach us what to do. And he's, the angel of the Lord says the exact same thing. He's to be a Nazarite his whole life. Your wife should stop drinking wine, eating grapes, don't eat anything unclean. When the child's born, don't let her raise or touch his head. He's going to be a Nazarite for his whole life. We are, he has a life mission to save the people of God. And they're overwhelmed, and they're like, hey, let's bring a goat out and, you know, serve you dinner. And the angel of the Lord says, if you're bringing out a goat, give it as a burnt offering to the Lord. And they do. He says, well, when the child's born, we want to honor you. What, what's your name? And the angel of the Lord tells us something marvelous about the Lord. He says, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? What he means there is, there's no one name that can capture who God is. There's no one word that can capture all of the amazingness of God, the creator, sustainer, redeemer. We can know God truly. If we are in Christ, we do know God truly on some level. But we will never, for all eternity, know God completely. It is beyond us. It's amazing. They've had this amazing moment. And then, verse 24, And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. We're just in the first stages, but redemption is coming for the people of God. This is the nativity of Samson's story. This is the advent of Samson's story. And it's really an amazing story. 
I think we have so much to learn from the next couple of chapters here of the story of Samson. But one thing, to repeat myself, God's already at work. And now two people know it. Maybe if you count Samson as he becomes cognizant of maybe who he's supposed to be and who he is, as they tell him why they never cut his hair, three people. God is at work, and he's bringing redemption. And of course, this story points us forward to the ultimate redemption. It wasn't a barren woman, right? It was a virgin woman. An even greater miracle. And a son that was not only set apart to God to save them from the Philistines, a son who was set apart to God, to be holy his entire life, to never sin, to never break God's commands, to not just save them from the Philistines, but to save them from their sin and from Satan and from the bonds of death. And redemption is coming even right now. It might be 10 minutes from now. It might be five days from now. It might be a 1,000 years from now. The Bible has told us redemption is coming, and God's plan is at work. And one day, that son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come again. And everyone who is in him or has ever been in him will enter into eternal life, the new heavens, the new earth. Therefore, we have hope. This is the beginning of hope for Israel. But we are already caught up in the greatest hope we can ever have. If you were in Christ, the great hope, the great son, the great advent, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may we honor you. And may we honor the son you have given. Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come and that you have saved. And Lord, you have promised you are constantly saving, saving new people daily to yourself, bringing them into your kingdom. But Lord, even those of us who are fully justified in you, you are sanctifying us now. You are making us to be more like you. And Lord, you will save and that you will take us into eternal life. And one day, the new heavens and the new earth. We rejoice in you. Lord, you are the true Samson. As we'll see, Samson failed. But you never did. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, may we go out with hope today, knowing you are at work in each one of our lives. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we go.
One more quick announcement. Uh, if you need me this week, unfortunately, you won't be able to get in touch with me. Not because I'm ignoring you, but literally where we're going, there's no cell phone coverage. So if you really need something, call Keith or Steve or Mike or, or one another. But be blessed uh, and hear this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.